I have a very special guest on this episode of the Misal podcast, a serial entrepreneur who's currently building his third startup. Not only that, he's building a global B2B SaaS product from a country where startups like his are fairly uncommon. His name is Muhammad Nasrullah and he's a founder of Integri. With Integri, companies can create app integrations that are incredibly easy to set up and use. Let's listen in. Welcome to the Misal Podcast, Nasrullah. How are you? I'm very well. Thank you for having me. Well, I followed your journey for a really long time. I remember you were involved with Pringit back in the day, uh, 2010s, early 2010s. So I know you went from Pringit to, you know, Convo and now Integri. So I would love to learn your journey so far and how you have been building products. So let's get started with a quick intro. Please tell me a little bit about yourself and what problem are you currently trying to solve with Integri? Yeah, absolutely. So I am... Uh... I'm Smula, my friends call me Nash. Uh, That's how I go by Twitter as well. I've been building companies since 2005, as a matter of fact. Um, I'm an old hand, that's when I graduated back in the day. I'm an engineer by training. Uh, All the companies I've built, I've been a technical co-founder. In many cases, I'm the CEO as well. Uh, Pring was actually my second company. My first company was like this computer-based training. Like you could learn how to use Word by the interactive online software. Ring was actually very early on. It started actually late 2000s. Um, and uh, it was a big risk because some what for the listeners who don't know, Ring uh, was a mobile social network, something like very early days of Twitter. So you could, for example, follow me on SMS. You could say, follow Nash and send it to a short code, double line, double zero. And you would get my updates. We used to call them praise. You'd get my praise. And it was uh, early days. And the reason why we chose text as a meaningless because everybody had all these mobile phones and smartphones weren't here. Uh, data, uh, 3G, etc. wasn't here. And so we sort of started from that. Um, it was hard to do that early days. There were no venture capitalists. So we had to go around private equity. We had to go find um, other businesses who could fund us. Uh, so we raised up to $2 million back in the day uh, on that. Uh, fast forward, uh, eventually we sold Pring. Uh, and then we, I worked at a, another startup called Convo, uh, still alive and still doing well. Um, I was VP engineering over there. And uh, so Convo is like a Facebook for work. Uh, so you can have your own company's Facebook. And while I was working there, one of the problems that we saw was that people wanted integrations. So just like Slack, it really becomes more powerful when you have integrations. And so we integrated with a few tools and our customers really loved it. They increase their usage and we asked our customers what other integration they want. And we realized that we wouldn't be able to build all of these in-house. So we looked around uh, finding a vendor which could do this, but we couldn't find anyone that would fit. So I, the head of integrations and another server-side engineer, we quit to start Integri. What Integri does is, uh, this is my current company, um, we help any B2B SaaS company in rolling out integrations for their customers. So say you are a CRM or a financial application or a project management, you need to have some level of integrations, whether that is importing customer data, syncing data, sending notifications, uh, sending out alerts, uh, building workflows. Uh, In today's world, no app works in isolation. So their apps are all interconnected. Uh, every app is unique. Every app has its own API. It's a huge pain. So Integri is like your, it's like internet plumbing. You move data from one app to the other and it helps you do it in a way without you having to spend a lot of engineering and product time on building out those integrations. So in short, you just take our SDK, you put it inside your app, and now your users have access to hundreds of apps that they can send or receive data from. When you started Integri, from the point where you started to up until now, how has the industry changed? Because I know, like, you know, of course, I work at a startup too, and we use a bunch of tools. We have Okta. We, I log into Okta, and it shows me all the tiles uh, for all my apps, and most of the apps are integrated. So I, I know behind the scenes that there's a lot going on for that to happen. But give me an example of, like, you know, a typical integration that you see often that companies, uh, you know, sign up for. The way the industry has changed is, or not just the industry, the world has changed is that we are buying more and more apps. If you look at the apps you use today, more than half of them did not exist maybe six, seven years ago. Um, and so there is a mass adoption. It used to be that the apps was the domain of the IT worker the or like on the technical side. 
and not every person from HR to finance is using apps. So there's a proliferation of apps. And once you buy so many apps and you buy the hundredth app for your company, you don't want to start from scratch. You want to reuse your existing data. You want to reuse your existing investments, right? And so um, any app wants, uh, the goal here would be that you start by importing what you have. So import is a big use case. And that could be CSV files. That could be from existing apps. That could be from Google spreadsheets or the very common use cases. And then beyond that, um, on an ongoing basis, depending upon the kind of app you have, you might want an ongoing sync. For example, if you are using financial data, let's say you are an SPNA, like a financial planning and uh, analysis platform, you need constantly to sync with, let's say, QuickBooks or things like that. So you need an ongoing sync. Uh, you might have some custom workflows. For example, when an employee joins your organization, you might want to send them a few uh, steps how to join on Slack. That could be an automation. And so there are a lot of things that you can do. But the key thing is that standalone apps was something in the early 2000s. No app is standalone anymore. And integrations used to be a late stage game, but now even if you're starting an app today, if you're building a CRM today, you need to have integrations from day one. Otherwise, people just won't be able to adopt your software. So it's like table stakes for entrepreneurs. Chat GPT is all the rage these days, and uh, you know AI is everyone is talking about AI. How does that help you, you know, build a better product, or does it like what do you do? Does it get replaced by something like AI? Because there's a lot of automation happening there too. So is there something that you are working on building uh, that would help you know SaaS companies? provide better integration? Absolutely. We have a, a very cool Outworks project behind the scenes that uh, we will be announcing shortly. And I can't talk much about it before the announcement, but it basically accelerates a whole bunch of things. But I will take a step back and talk about in, in AI in general. Previously, the way it used to work is that developers would code the entire thing end to end. Uh, let's call this algorithmic programming. You write the algorithm and it does the whole thing. And now something is that there's a, a spectrum here now, the algorithm work that you have to do is now slowly being replaced by the AI part. So for example, let's say you're writing a text parser. You want to process a document. Uh, you don't have to write the whole algorithm for that. You can just use chat GPT or any LLM to just do it for you. And what is happening is that the productivity is 10x. Uh, it would take you many weeks to write a good text parser for something. Let's say you have a text parser for PDFs that are invoices, and you want to get, let's say, the the, the total of invoice amount. You want to get the line items out. It would take a significant effort on the part of an algorithm to do that. But with ChatGPT or LLM, you can do it much, much faster, uh, and it's really easy to iterate over that. So one thing is that every company is going to become an AI augmented company. Uh, every company will be using AI. If they're not, they're going to be left behind because AI will let Companies that use AI to move 10 times faster. So that's definitely happening. The other thing that's going to happen is that every software engineer is going to become a AI engineer. I mean, it's not the typical sense of AI. If you're a software engineer, think of AI as just another API. You just need to understand what's happening so behind the scenes. So for example, just like a software engineer had to learn MySQL or MongoDB, it's just another one of those things. You just need to understand how it works, how to use it, and how to use it in workflows. Um, we are only seeing the tip of the impact of AI if the progress on AI stopped today. So for example, today, ChatGPT and also API. If all progress on AI stopped today, it will take the next five to 10 years to for the world to realize all the things that they can do with this technology. It's going to take a lot of time. And, and when it's sort of funny or sad is um, the AI that everybody's building on is actually three years old. Uh, and GPT models came out a long time ago, but we didn't really recognize what you could do with this. It was only until uh, OpenAI then did ChatGPT and everybody realized, oh, wow, you can do all this stuff. So the API for ChatGPT actually came out today, but people had been inspired by what you can do and building stuff on that. So you could have built everything on AI a couple of years ago. There is no significant change in technology from OpenAI, uh, which was available. But uh, it's very interesting how a lot of people missed out what you can do with uh, AI and how uh, there's like a whole sea change happening right now. I know a lot of people are building a lot of things and I was just, just like half an hour ago, I was thinking like if it was possible for me to write my tweets, but uh, for, you know, some kind of API that would read my previous tweets. And when I'm tweeting or 
when I'm trying to talk about a topic, it will have the similar personality or tone as I've had uh, in the past. So, I mean, I've tweeted like, what, I don't know, two, 3,000 times. So I think it's enough uh, tweets for it to realize like, okay, this is how I talk. This is how I, you know, punctuate. This is how my, you know, attitude is. Sometimes I'm sarcastic. Sometimes I'm like, you know, really curious. So those are the kind of tools that I look forward to using where someone would go and read like, for example, my blog post and then help me draft, you know, new articles based on that uh, information that's already out there. Because I don't remember every single thing I've written, right? Uh, but to being able to get that, you know, extracted from previous articles and use that into future articles, I think that's that's where, at least that's where I'm looking at uh, when it comes to AI as to how it will be using that. And I, I know we jumped ahead a little bit. So I also want to understand because you, you know, uh, spend your time between Pakistan and San Francisco. So Please tell me a little bit about how does that work out for you as a founder? You know, you probably have like a team that you work with. And how did you make your initial hiring decisions? Because you knew that you would not be full time in Pakistan and spending time between two countries. Even though we started the company within Pakistan, we started as a U.S. company from day one. So we are a Delaware C, uh, C corporation uh, registered in the Delaware, as well as uh, we have uh, offices in San Francisco. Um, we did this from day one even though the team largely started in Pakistan. And so I knew that I would have to be in the U.S. to kickstart this and push this forward. Pakistan is actually unique when it comes to the U.S. is because the time zone is just so far apart, it's incredibly hard. I mean, it's just not a good spread. Uh, it's exactly 12 hours apart. And so what happens is that, uh, so in, we started the company before the pandemic and we designed it to be distributed from the get-go. Uh, we did not want you to be disadvantaged if you were working in a different place. We did not want you to come to the office just to do something. And this worked really well for us because it allows us to be resilient. Uh, it allows us to have hiring pools from different parts of the world where uh, talent might exist, but they might not be willing to um, physically come to a place and stuff like that. So we put a lot of thought and effort behind building a distributed company. And we have a lot of rituals and a lot of uh, processes and lightweight, nothing heavy to just uh, help people contribute in a meaningful way, productive way. So it, it, but it's not for everyone. I can assure you that it's hard. Uh, it, it requires a certain type of person. Uh, it works well for introverts or some extroverts that need to get out and do something more. But uh, in the field we're in, we generally attract more introverts. Um, but I think this has been a really good model for us and something that works well. But going forward, we're adding more and more presence in San Francisco, uh, in the U.S. as well. Uh, we've hired people in Canada, we've hired people in, in the Bay Area. So that's something that we continue on uh, growing. You know, there's a lot of talent in Pakistan, but my limited experience, like it's it's not, uh, I would what I would say is like, there's a lot of raw talent in Pakistan, but it's not polished enough. And so how did you go about, you know, picking people engineers because you have a highly technical product right and as yourself being a technical person you must have like given a lot of emphasis on hiring a really solid technical team that's interesting i have a lot of ceo friends who like to complain that they can't find the right quality of talent in pakistan and my counter argument is that well what's your benchmark do you mean like the this engineer that you want here is not as good as an engineer in san francisco well, you're also paying them 10 times less than what the engineer in San Francisco gets paid, right? So expect them to work as good as a San Franciscan engineer, a Bay engineer, but you don't want to pay a Bay salary. So I don't think that's correct. There are lots of people in Pakistan who work for SaaS companies. I have a list of about 80 SaaS companies that have some presence in Pakistan. These are international companies at international levels. And so the talent is here. The appetite to pay is what is in question. Most founders who are bootstrapping, they will pay us um, an amount which makes sense for a bootstrap company. But if you're a venture-backed company and if you are not paying the really best here, uh, which you can, I think that is unfair. But obviously, you have to be careful in, in the kind of people you hire. Uh, what we look for the most is the ability to think and solve problems and then the ability to get stuff done. These are the two most fundamental things. Uh, the implied uh, relationship here is also hard work. The ability to work hard and just getting things done here. And that's what we look for. Uh, 
we've had people who've been really great, just fresh out of university as well, as well as people who have worked in SaaS companies, uh, have lived abroad. And so you can find both spectrums uh, on, on both uh, talents on both sides of the spectrum here. And then there has been a lot of funding in the Far East and the Middle East, and they hire engineers from within Pakistan. So you would have venture funded, uh, dollar paid employees uh, who have the experience and the exposure and they're working within Pakistan. So you have those folks as well. So we, in for example, in Pakistan, we pay in dollars. We decided to shift from rupees to dollars in the beginning of 2011, when the rupees started this freefall. Uh, we realized and recognized that we budgeted everything in the US in dollars. And so we were benefiting from the depreciation of the rupee. And I thought that to some degree that is wrong. And we sort of shifted to that. That's a long way of saying that if your company is able to do so, if it's able to benefit employees, it should definitely do that. And I think that itself is a great means that to attract great talent. So your customers are paying you in dollars, which makes it easier for you to pay you know, your employees in dollars, and which is something that's not happening with most of the startups in Pakistan. I just wanted to also ask you a little bit about like, you know, what about the ecosystem? What do you think? What are your thoughts on the ecosystem? Like, you know, what kind of work is being done? Where are things lacking? And yeah, in general. I really love the progress you've made uh, all the way from having practically no venture capital firms almost a decade ago to so many venture firms. But more importantly is having high quality founders. Most of the founders that you see high quality are those that have either just returned back to Pakistan. Um, and these are those who have seen exposure, they have seen how a fast break startup works and they're bringing that experience back in Pakistan. So that's, I think, a big deal. And that's what allows them to sort of uh, they know the path, they've seen the path of how a company like that grows. So they don't have a lot of figuring out to do in that sense. So that's definitely great. What we need, however, is more osmosis. So for example, this podcast is great. You can talk about things you've done right, things you've done wrong. And what you want to do is be able to help the next wave of entrepreneurs understand what has not worked and what has worked. It's sort of like standing on the shoulders of giants, but essentially... If you want to learn and make your own mistakes, that's very expensive. Um, for example, if somebody raised a hundred million dollars um, in Pakistan and they flamed out, it would be really great for the entire ecosystem if they explain what they did wrong and what would they do differently so that the next batch of entrepreneurs could learn from them. So I think that's uh, key. That's what I feel is missing. Typically, uh, there is in, in Pakistan, I'm sure that's the case in other parts of the world as well, where Talking about failure is taboo. There's penalty, there's penalization over there. Uh, and I think that really sort of hinders growth of the person, of the ecosystem. And I think that is a really important thing for us to uh, be able to uh, destigmatize. So you can fail as long as you give it your very best um, and you learn from that and then you go at it again. Uh, so, you know, I think uh, that is something which we will keep on learning. What we do need are success stories. We do have a few, uh, but we still need to keep on growing and keep on building upon that momentum. It's funny that you mentioned that, uh, you know, someone who's raised $100 million and, you know, not been able to make it uh, big. Um, you know, I have reached out to a few people who I personally know, they didn't make, raise $100 million, but, you know, even the one that who did raise $100 million, I did reach out to them trying to figure out like, you know, if I can get them to talk about like, you know, what what, what did they learn? Like, you know, that's, that's a lot of money to spend on something and not being able to learn something, right? Because there's so many lessons there. But uh, majority of the time, like, I mean, I think all the time, I, I've never had anyone who wanted to talk about it, um, at least, you know, on record. Um, a lot of people, um, there are a few people who, very small startups back in early in the day, they just wanted to talk to me. Like they would like, oh, you know, I'll talk to you off the record. There is a lot of learnings, but I have not been able to get these people or founders to come on the show and talk about it. But that doesn't mean I'll stop trying. And I feel like at least two years from now, at least a year from now, if I'm still doing this, uh, I hope I am, there will be a lot more founders who will be in the same boat as like people who have failed startup. And uh, it would be interesting to see if they are willing to talk about what they've learned. This is harder to do in Pakistan because it's a cultural thing. Uh, we are very much a spectator centered uh, country. So there, if you look at our TV, most popular things are talk shows. People are just commenting on things. They're not 
less people are doing things. So the person who's doing things, everybody is analyzing and, and overanalyzing and commenting on what this person is doing. And as a result, there's a lot of default posturing. I will posture to you as if I know what I'm talking about. I will posture to you as if I am flawless. It's a lot of projecting. And what that hurts is it doesn't allow you to grow. It doesn't allow you to be honest both with yourself and the people you talk to. And so when this house of cards falls down, uh, when that company implodes, all of that posturing was like, what was all that then? You know, you, you question everything. And so I think it really helps being honest. I've met some really fantastic um, CEOs in San Francisco and their honesty is sort of light boggling. It's almost like a, like a whiplash. Like, yeah, so you, you simply ask, how are things going? And they've been like, it's going great, but we just missed our Q1 targets. Things aren't going that great, but we're working on these things. And you don't expect that to be literally the opening conversation, but uh, that's the level of honesty which I think you need. There's a lot, of course, happening in the ecosystem. I happen to get a lot of these pitches, announcements, and stuff like that. And it's most of the time, like you said, it's there's a lot of you know, it's a there's a lot of marketing, a lot of PR gained. They're trying to game the PR machine, which is basically trying to get more coverage about the startup. It's a Slack update if you have a. MOU with the company, right? Like it's a partnership, right? It's you update it on Slack, you update it on LinkedIn. You don't reach out to people via email saying, hey, we wrote this press release. Can you you know, publish it on our website? And I'm like, I've never done that. I probably never will because I know there is no substance there. It's better to like actually do the work. And I think there are very few startups. I think my one of my favorite startups is um, Bazaar. And I think it's doing a lot of good work. I um, heard good things about it. Cautiously optimistic about the whole ecosystem. One question I wanted to ask you is like, like, you know, when you started off, you probably went in with certain assumptions, like you you thought about certain things a certain way. What were some of those challenges that you faced? Now that there have been so many um, startups made, this process is now very well understood. And I think the pioneer in this space was Dr. Professor Steve Blank. He wrote a book called The Four Stuffs of the Epiphany. And his latest book, uh, which came out a few years ago, is called The Startup Owner's Manual. And he describes a process known as customer development. It is basically if you're a very early startup, you're trying to figure out broad market fit, BMF, you're trying to figure out if there's a need for your solution, that it's a vision, that it's not a hallucination. And so uh, there are a lot of validation that you have to do. And so you have to use the scientific method, and this goes back to being honest. Um, so for example, as a founder, you put everything behind your company, and you really want this to work. But once you go to the market, the assumption you had was, hey, people will buy my product. Once you talk to the people, you realize they are not going to buy my product because there's really no need here. What do you do at that point? And all this founder will then introspect and find, is there something adjacent here? Do we pivot to something here? And there's some, like um, a conversation that you had, which is very honest, brutally honest, to figure out how do you go forward from here, right? Um, and so you should be learning new things every day. Uh, you should be testing out consumptions every day. This is really hard to do because it is hard to separate what you want the world to be versus what the world is. This is the cause of any emotional pain. Any emotional pain you describe, this is the core of it. What you want and what it is, is just two different things. And so what you want to do is you want to make sure that you're being very honest and transparent if you're not able to do so because, because you're so emotionally invested. Um, what you want to do is you want to get a third party, advisors, mentors, who you can explain the problem to. And as you verbalize, vocalize the problem, and they give you feedback, because they don't have an emotional attachment, they will give you a more clear, uh, a more non-emotional, let's say, uh, feedback to that problem. And this is a very good technique to use. Another te and there are other techniques that you can use as well, but that's typically what you do. This is also known as the King's solo loss paradox. You are much better at advising people than at following your own advice. Because it's really easy to tell I what is wrong here because you don't have an emotional state. But it's much harder to apply that same thing to yourself because now your emotions are involved and the state you want the world to be versus the state of sin is in public. So, you know, uh, things like that sort of uh, uh, conflate.
it's very difficult to get especially pakistani founders to talk about ideas that they're thinking like someone is going to steal it or someone's going to take it or someone's going to do something with it and i have always like felt that you have to be comfortable with sharing your ideas because even if someone steals your idea it's very difficult to steal execution you control that and there are a couple of startups uh, that i'm i'm currently like talking to the founder is like advising them on a few things and it's always like you know they're like struggling in terms of like okay i really know this person who who's done this before me i'm just you know i don't want to reach out to this person or learn from him or you know figure out how to do things and i'm like always pushing him like you know if you can approach the person definitely do it and learn from them because that's the best way to do it i will tell you two things on this uh one is that this is also a cultural thing um and this is in general being defensive but i think this goes back to being honest right and so if so, so first of all you're right ideas are dime a dozen anybody can think about hey and you should go to the moon by building a rocket ship, putting all this together, a science program, and putting a man on the moon is an entirely different thing. And startups are so hard and painful that if anybody heard your idea and they did it, good on them. I think they deserve to be able to do it, right? Uh, but the reality is that even with your experience, your know-how, getting your idea to a success is just incredibly hard. And this whole thing of ideas get stolen is, is early ecosystem thinking. As the ecosystem matures, this is no longer the case. Uh, so I think that's definitely something which is very important on that. And so I think um, the other thing, for example, during the time of prayer, one of the mistakes I did was we did not have any mentors who had been there, done that. So we had nobody from outside of Pakistan. We had nobody from the U.S. Like we could have reached out to people like uh, who have run or seen these large companies or social media companies. And they would have been able to advise us, but we did not think big enough, right? And so a, a really great way of leveling up is talking to people who have done it before, been there, done that. And you build a relationship by trust and by getting things done. So I'll give you an example. If you find somebody who you want to be your mentor, what you do is you, uh, you have a conversation with them. They will give you some advice and suggestions. Now... If you get back to them the very next time, a week or whatever, and you come back and say, hey, remember we talked about this? I executed on this and this and this. This is what we found. These things worked. These things didn't work. And then this is what we did. This is a fantastic relationship. That mentor understand this guy listens to me and goes and executes this. I have real impact. I can really change the trajectory of this company. And then they get more involved. And so... That's how it is. And that's how you build a great relationship with mentors and advisors, right? What is worse is if you talk to a mentor and then you talk to them a month later, it's as if you've never talked before. There is no accountability. There's none of that. So, um, and the third hack of this is is to read. If you read stories, biographies, uh, books around um, anybody, any person's experience, it's like that person sitting down and explaining six hours their life story and how they did the whole thing. It's a huge meta skill, which uh, might be underutilized, but if you just learn and study from existing knowledge that's simply out there, you can very quickly level up your game and not do the same mistakes that uh, they might have done. I have one more question about like, you know, B2B SaaS. Um, so there's not much going on in terms of B2B SaaS, especially in Pakistan, where, you know, the product is build, being built in Pakistan, but the customers are outside of Pakistan. So... Is there a reason, because I'm sure you must have come across founders trying to build something similar to like what you are building in B2B SaaS space. And what were their concerns? Like what is stopping them from building a world-class product in Pakistan and just, you know, marketing it everywhere else in the world? Actually, I'll say that before 10 years ago, if you wanted to do a startup, it had to be a B2B startup because you could sign a contract, you could uh, get payments, you can do all of that. It wasn't until you had enough payment infrastructure where you could charge smaller amounts by uh, bank transfers or credit cards that the B2C world has opened up. Uh, and this is very typical for early ecosystem. Typically, it starts off B2B and then a B2C layer gets added and those companies are at scale while there are these early opportunities. The key reason why a B2B company, it's our... That what are the challenges for a B2B company? First of all, you need to understand who your software is for. And you need to be uh, you need to uh, be like in the day of the life of your customer. And that customer is somebody in the US, is somebody in Europe, is somebody in Australia. And that kind of exposure is not very common. So if you're building a B2B, it's something that you have to sort of 
uh, go out and sort of see it for yourself. There are exceptions to this. Uh, sometimes you'll find people, for example, building a developer tool and you have developers around you, but you can build something for them. A great example comes to mind is Postman. Postman is a tool that came out of India, has a hundred million something, um, a ridiculous number of, um, of, of developers using it. It's a, it started off as a free tool and now it's a powerhouse for API development. And so you can start by scratching your own itch. Uh, there are other uh, very interesting examples in Pakistan. Uh, remote interview started in Karachi where you would uh, test and quote um, candidates. And they start by, I think, scratching their own itch. There are other companies there as well, from Bossify to there's uh, Repair Desk in Lahore. And so there are these companies that understand the customer. That is the biggest, uh, the, the biggest sort of, uh, I think, hurdle of building a B2B company. You see, don't really see the problem and you don't understand it to be real, it's very hard for the founder to implement a solution for it. That's why B2C becomes more popular because in our daily life, there are many B2C problems. There's transportation, there's education, there is all these things, right? And so um, I think that what it's exposure, but there are ways around that, uh, whether that is by traveling, it is whether by talking to people, whether by it's meeting with a large number of uh, people in the business world. So I think there are different things that you can do to get acquainted with the customer or the potential customer. Lastly, I say that if you want to start a startup, don't start with an idea, start with a problem. Uh, when you start with a problem, if you make a solution for that problem, the people suffering from that problem are automatically your customers. Whereas if you start with an idea, you then have to find someone with the problem and then make them your customer. So it's a lot easier to just start off by starting off with the problem. Uh, looking back, whatever you have accomplished so far, your journey so far, is there anything that when you look back, you would you tell yourself like, I should have done this differently? A hundred things. Absolutely. I would do something differently last month. I would do something differently last week. There, Absolutely. Uh, there are so many mistakes and so many things that could have been done better. Hindsight being 2020. Uh, it's hard to just pinpoint one or, you know, but absolutely. Um, and the problem with this question is that the answer is very personal and very unique. Uh, what I might have faced might not be generalizable. But if I were to generalize my advice, I think it is, uh, it is I think, what we just talked about. How do we really own it? Uh, because honesty builds accountability. How do we honest with yourself? Build mentors or systems around you to keep you honest and you want to once you see the reality has changed the ability to accept that new reality and to react to it is really important and uh it's very easy to get opinionated you might think you're right without having data there's a saying that in god we trust everybody else bring data so i think uh you should do that you should bring substantiation, right? And so I think that would be my number one sort of thing. I mean, that would be the root of a lot of the problems that came through uh, would be that. Well, uh, thank you for taking out the time and sharing the wealth of information that you have. But thank you so much for being on the Missile Podcast. I appreciate coming over and I'm happy to chat again if there's any topic or if your viewers have any questions, uh, they can definitely reach out. I'm at Nash on Twitter or Nash at Integrity.io. Um, if you have any questions, please do shoot me an email. I'm happy to sort of uh, engage and answer all the questions. Thanks for listening to the Missile Podcast. I hope you enjoyed the podcast and will thank me by writing a review or sharing it on social media. Make sure you follow and subscribe so you don't miss the next episode. Thanks again. See you soon.